so I'm here to talk about inference at scale. Um, so I, I won't go through this whole deck because it's uh, a lot of slides where I can also go into the sort of usage and engineering part, but I'll just talk about the problem and an open source platform that we have created to um, solve this problem. Um, I'd like to start by talking about the maturity levels that organizations go through as they adopt uh, big data. At first, they are at the latent stage where they just produce data by producing logs and so on, but don't systematically use it for anything. For example, if we consider a movie streaming site, they produce logs about who are streaming what movies, but they don't really use them. Uh, then we get to the analysis stage where uh, the data is used to inform decisions made by humans. For example, in your movie streaming case, it would be looking at who are watching what kind of movies and producing reports about that that uh, are shown to editors that then can they then curate lists of recommendations um, for the users. Then we get to the learning stage where you try to cut the human out of the immediate loop and automatically um, generate the decisions that you will then replicate online uh, as part of your application when you're running, right? Um, and this is where you apply machine learning, obviously. And uh, for our movie recommendation example, it would be automatically learning uh, list of movie recommendations for different segments of users, and then at the serving stage, just uh, showing those lists to users, and then rebuilding them uh, once a day or something like that. At last, we get to the acting phase, where you, you take your data about what is happening and what has happened, and apply that data to make decisions on the fly when they are needed by some user or uh, something happening in the world. Um, and there are two interesting and very different subcases here. The one, the one that you, most people think most about is what's called uh, either stream processing or model serving, where uh, you have a single data item and you want to evaluate your model and if it's a stream of data, it's called stream processing, or if you're doing it in request response fashion, then it's called model serving, right? For example, in your movie case, it would be assigning a quality score or something to each movie as you add it to, to your system. The other case, which is the subject of this talk, is what we call big data serving, which is where you need to evaluate your model over many data items for every single request to your system. An example here is a movie recommendation, where you do the recommendation, evaluating your recommendation model over all your movies for every request that a user makes uh, to see some list of movies. Right? There are some obvious advantages to uh, deferring the decision making to the um, point where the decision needs to be made, and they are as follows. Uh, you can use all the up-to-date information that you have. You can take into account what the user just did, uh, and the latest information you have about, for example, the movies in the moving movie example case. And importantly, you don't waste any uh, computation. If you do all your decision making offline upfront, you need to create a decision for every single thing that might happen in your system until the next uh, iteration, right? For example, in, your, in the movie case, you would need to create a list of recommendations for every single user that might show up in your next uh, period, right? And that leads to a lot of wasted uh, computation. And for the same reason, that computation can't be really fine-grained, right? You can't create a list of new recommendations for every single user offline in case they show up because it's way too costly, both in computing it and uh, transferring it to your, um, to your online serving system and so on. Lastly, in typical examples where people do this kind of decision-making offline, uh, uh, 
ahead of time. They end up with architectural workarounds to those other other limitations. The typical ex example that we see with big uh, companies that we work with is they try to mitigate the um, problem that the information is not uh, up to date by having smaller models with smaller data sets that they run in parallel and then merge information and so on. So it, this leads to a lot of uh, complications. While if you can treat the system that do the real-time decision making uh, as a black box, the rest of your architecture becomes much simpler because you just write all the information that you have to that system and you make requests to it as you need it to make some decisions. And that's it. Obviously, it's complicated on the inside, but not uh, on the outside, right? So, when we have these advantages, uh, it seems like something that people should do a lot, right? But uh, currently, they don't. And why is that? It's because it's really hard. It combines a lot of hard problems uh, at the same time, right? You have states, so you need to manage the state because if you are evaluating a model over a single data point, you can just send that data point to the system when you need an evaluation to be made, right? But if you're evaluating over thousands or millions or billions of data points for every request, then the system needs to have all the data inside it uh, in order to work fast enough, right? Um, also, to make it fast, you need to scatter the uh, workload for every request to many nodes and have them run in parallel. It's not a complication. And doing that with consistent low latency is pretty challenging. And because you're typically exposed directly to end users and need to respond in real time, you need high availability, which is not a complication, right? So in more detail, what are the requirements what do you need from this black box that does the real-time decision-making for you? You need to be able to make inferences typically in tens of, tens of milliseconds or all your data, because if you have, if you're dealing with humans, they start to get annoyed if they observe a end-to-end -end latency of more than about 400 milliseconds. And since you need budget for network, front-ends, and so on, that typically translates to a latency budget of less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, typically, you need, you want to have up-to-date data. That's one of the advantages, right? So you need to handle real-time updates at a high continuous rate while you're doing your uh, uh, inferences. Um, you need to be able to scale to large amounts of data because that's part of the point, right? And also to large amount of requests because there's typically lots of end users and lots of things going on, so we need to be able to uh, scale to that. And you need high availability, you need to, which translates to being able to recover from hardware failures uh, without any human intervention. And it also translates to being able to evolve the system, the data schemas, the logic, the models, and even the hardware you run on while you are uh, serving and handling the rights to your data at the same time. And because this is just the inference serving part of a big data stack, you also need to integrate with the other parts of the big data stack, like, for example, Hadoop for uh, the, the offline machine learning, uh, machine learning tools like TensorFlow and so on for actually producing the models, things like that. So this is a tall order, so most projects can't really do it by themselves. It, costs a lot to uh, create a platform that can do all these things. So that's why I'm here to tell you about a platform that can do it, which we call Vespa, which is open source and available at vespa.ai. And it uh, makes all these requirements uh, available in a nice package for everybody. Um, it grew out of uh, um, trying to solve, or actually solving, uh, the web search problem, which is, when you think about it, a canonical big data serving problem. You have lots of data, and you have lots of requests coming in, and you need to evaluate the machine learning model to match the queries of the users uh, to each of the documents, right? And 
because there are an almost infinite amount of possible potential queries, you can't pre-compute the results for every given query. So you need to do everything in real time, right? So at some time around 2000 or something like that, it became apparent that solving this problem was really, really valuable. So a lot of money uh, started appearing in this space, which means we could actually do the investment to uh, solve this problem well uh, for the web search case, which is what we started doing. Um, in Yahoo, uh, where I used to work, we created two systems to solve this kind of problem. One is, was Hadoop for the offline part, and then we had Vespa for the online uh, serving part, and both were engineered from the same principle, which is the principle you need to scale to large amounts of data, which is you don't fetch the data to compute something out of data, because that doesn't scale to a lot of data because you run out of bandwidth. Instead, you create some representation of the computation that you want, and then you push the computation to the data to evaluate locally where the data is stored. Right? Um, so a little bit about where we use Vespa at uh, Verizon Media, where I work now, which used to be uh, Yahoo. Um, we have a cloud service where we run Vespa for these uh, use cases. I'm talking a little bit about it because it's the use case I know best because we run the service for uh, this company. Uh, we are serving over a billion users, about 250,000 queries per second to the various Vespa applications that we have. There are around 150 different applications. Um, about uh, Slightly less, I think, than 100 billion uh, content items, videos, articles, ads, and so on uh, at the moment. Um, and one of the use cases is the third largest ad network in the world after uh, Google and Facebook. So uh, here we can see two of the use cases of Vespa in action. If you go to the uh, yahoo.com page, you will see a list of articles and videos that are personalized for uh, you, the user. And that personalization is a recommendation use case where uh, we evaluate a model over you as a user, if you know anything about you, over all the videos and articles that we have to find the, uh, the best matches. And those are the ones that are shown at the page. So that is done in real time by Vespa whenever you visit the page. Uh, one of these things that try to look like an article but it's not is an ad, and that is from that uh, ad system I mentioned. Right? This is called native ads, and uh, it's a big thing at the moment because people click more if it looks like uh, an article. Right? So lots of people think ads are evil, but they are also what makes it possible for all the poor people in the world to use all the services on the internet for free, right? So that's the flip side uh, of ads. Okay, so I've been talking about implicitly about two use cases of big data serving, which are the most well-known ones, where Vespa is uh, used a lot, both in my company and other companies. Um, and also search and recommendation. So in search, the query is a bunch of keywords typed by the user, maybe some representation of the context uh, and personal information about the user as well. Uh, and the model that is evaluated is a relevance model comparing that query and contextual information to every document uh, that might uh, score well. Uh, and the items that you finally return are selected by high relevance, right? In recommendation, the query is some kind of model of the user, like an embedding of the user in a vector space. Uh, it's very common. In addition, you typically have some filters saying what kind of um, items are eligible for that user. And the model is a recommendation model, like um, um, 
typically either a neural net or just a dot product between the vector or the user and the vector or um, or the content items, something like that, right? And again, you select the items by the recommendation score. Uh, so those two use cases are well known, but uh, one takeaway you can take from this presentation, and uh, maybe an opportunity for you if you don't work in search or recommendation, is to think about what other things can I do if I have this capability to evaluate a machine learning model uh, with real low latency over uh, lots of data items, right? Um, and one way to find those use cases, I think, is to break it down like this. Um, so here's one example, actually, from um, a real-world uh, use case where people are doing something clever. Uh, if your item sees some priced assets, for example, stocks, and you have a machine or model which is a price uh, predictor, you can create queries that are representations of some event happening in the world that is relevant for that price predictor model, right? And then you can evaluate that model given a query over all your price assets. And then rather than selecting the ones with the highest price, which would be similar to what you do in the search and recommendation case, you select by the largest predicted price difference and the result here is that you can very quickly, using all up-to-date information about all your assets, uh, find the ones that would change in price the most if given some event happening, right? And there are two use cases for that. Uh, one is you can speculatively think about events that happen um, and then see what would happen to the price. And the other use case is reacting really quickly to events that actually happen in the world. Because if you have this model and you run it on Vespa, you can compute the changes that will happen faster than anybody else can. And as you know, in finance, that's uh, really valuable. So that's just a different, uh, a very different ex example use case that uh, leverages the same capabilities as you do in search and recommendation which is the common big data serving uh, capabilities, right? Um, yeah, let me quickly, very quickly go over this. So uh, big data serving is often confused with uh, analytics. Uh, analytics is where you have lots and lots of data and you want to run some queries to find something, find out something about that data, right? But typically in analytics, you are paying somebody to do your analytics for you, which means they can wait a few seconds without being annoyed. And there are a few of these people, so you don't need a lot of parallelization. And it's okay if things are down uh, now and then. Uh, while in big data serving, none of those things are true, right? So that's why there are some big, some differences between these kind of systems. Okay, so that was a very, brief introduction to the big data serving problem and Vespa, which is an open source uh, engine that uh, um, that solves that problem. Now I'll go in slightly more detail into what uh, Vespa can do for you. So Vespa can do both text search and structured uh, selection or structured data uh, combined in the same query or just one or the other. Um, it, uh, it has an inference engine that can uh, evaluate some machine learn model or, in, or hand written model over uh, all the matching data items. Uh, it can do query time organization and aggregation of all the data um, in real time. And it can do all this while it's sustaining real time writes at a high uh, rate. To typically, we see a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of writes per second per node. Um, the clusters are elastic and all recovering. So if you lose a node, Vespa will automatically redistribute data over the remaining nodes. If you add or remove hardware, it will do the same thing. So which means you can 
change your hardware as you go and you don't need ops people to react if there is some mold buying and things like that. Uh, it also has a processing logic container written in Java because people like to add their own uh, business logic on top of Vespa. Um, and because the clusters can typically consist of many nodes, uh, they are managed, so Vespa will manage the system and the clusters uh, for you and set them up for you. So just briefly about the high level architectures, as, as I mentioned, it's a two tier system. All the incoming requests and writes comes or HTTP or HTTPS to a stateless Java container. And below that we have content clusters that stores the actual content that you want to do inferences over and select over and do the distributed part of the query execution. And then we have an admin and configuration subsystem that manages all these clusters for you. And what the user, the application developer is seeing is a higher level abstraction, which we call an application package, which contains a description of the clusters that you want to run, as well as any additional Java components you have, the machine learn models you have and things like that. So the application developer creates this package and deploys it to Vespa, which will then set up the system for you. And if you want to change the system, you just change your application package and deploy again, and Vespa will carry out the changes to the system for you in a safe way. So I mentioned that the key point of Vespa is to be able to do these inferences over large amount of data um, with low latency. So how do we achieve this low latency? Well, there are three main strategies to do that. The first is parallelization. Uh, we divide, automatically divide the data items that you write to Vespa into uh, the nodes of your cluster in parallel. And then when you run queries, they will be scattered to all the content nodes that have part of that data in parallel. Uh, and on each of the nodes, we will dynamically shard over the cores of the node to run part of the workload of that query in parallel on many cores. Uh, secondly, we do the obvious thing that uh, search engines do, which is to prepare data structures uh, at write time and in the background in order to make the query time faster. And the most common case, or most, most well-known case at least, is posting lists in search engines, right? But there are other uh, cases where we do that. Uh, and just as importantly, we move as much execution as possible to the data nodes, because the thing you most often run out of here is uh, bandwidth from here uh, to here, because if you need to send the data here uh, to do any computation, then you run out of bandwidth here, and that's just not local bandwidth, but it's bandwidth in your data center, right? Which has a very hard limit, and it's very costly to increase that limit, right? So when you deploy an application package with machine learning models, those models are uh, copied to all the content nodes so that we can evaluate locally on all the um, on all the content nodes in parallel. Uh, so this is an example showing how we get more scaling out of that compared to TensorFlow serving, but uh, I'll skip that. Um, yeah, I'll do a few more slides. This one I'll skip, too much detail. Um, so as I mentioned, Vespa has an inference engine based on a model of tensors where you can model both uh, dense tensors using indices and sparse tensors where you use uh, labels like in a map to uh, address your values and you can combine that freely. Uh, then we have a tensor mathematical language that has six primitive functions. Um, join, map, reduce, and a few uh, more. And based on uh, composing those primitive uh, functions, we can provide all the functions that you expect from something like TensorFlow. Um, 
we provide those higher level functions as convenience, but they're really just implemented in terms of our simpler functional uh, language, which is really nice for us because it allows us to uh, optimize without optimizing lots and lots of different functions, right? We only have six functions uh, that we can optimize to optimize all the different cases we have. Uh, so you can write in this mathematical language uh, directly, but if you have a complex model, that's too much work, right? So we provide the ability to just put uh, a TensorFlow or OMX or XGBoost actually model directly into the REST application package or many models, and REST probably understand them and convert them to uh, this mathematical representation and uh, use that representation to evaluate them at runtime. Uh, so lots and lots of more interesting stuff here, but I'll skip it and go directly to the highlight of the talk, which is questions. Are there any questions? We have yes. one, one question, yep, go ahead. So, um, how is that uh, different with machine learning modeling learning algorithms where you just advance the train set and keep going? How, how is VESPA different from that? So, how is VESPA different from the regular online learning uh, algorithms where you just advance the train set or you can model one per second or whatever? How, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so um, online learning. So, VESPA don't have an opinion on how you do your learning uh, as such. It has no built-in way to do learning or anything like that. Um, so it's just to be able to scale the inference, right? So people have, we have a lot of cases where people do online learning, typically some kind of reinforcement learning where they keep updating the parameters to the model uh, all the time and you can do that with Vespa by doing writes, but the learning part uh, itself is outside Vespa, right? It's not part of what we do, yeah. Okay, well thank you very much, John. Very uh, elucidating presentation.